The story of Marvel Madness begins in 1984. Mark Cerny, who would later go on to be the lead producer and architect of both the PS Vita and the PS4, I kid you not, created this fun little arcade game where you navigate a marble around a surreal MC Urcher inspired environment. It was a huge hit, but also had several firsts to its name. For one, it was the first game off the production line to use the Atari System 1 hardware, but also pioneered stereo sound, as well as, supposedly, being the first ever game to be programmed using C, although I couldn't really find any credible sources on that one. Mark Cerny, give me a call. Regardless, it was ported to every home console and computer you can think of, and probably more. And eventually, and more specifically to this video, it finally made its way to the Nintendo Game Boy. Released by Mindscape and Tengen in the May of 1991, the isometric welds and arcade nature of Marble Madness made it an ideal candidate for the system. So does it live up to the high standards set by a man who would literally go on to create a PlayStation? The control you have in Marble Madness is very simple, much like the protagonist. You're a marble, and what do marbles do? They roll. Your control of the marble is limited to the direction you roll, as well as the speed of said rolling. The A or B buttons will give you a second speed level, but otherwise, there is no way to defend yourself and attack. You can either roll away, or roll away a little bit faster. What is out there to an attack a unassuming marble, you might ask? Well, there are bad marbles which knock you around, a thing that's somewhere between a piece of macaroni and a slinky, a frightening array of carpets, and even some totally tubular waves. Some of these enemies will kill you, but others just knock you in a random direction, which brings us to the other major danger in Marble Madness. There aren't very many guardrails and whatever sick version of reality that this is based on, and since you slip and slide all over the place, Death by falling rainbow road style is very much a possibility. A large portion of the landscape is not flat either. So making it to the goal line of each level is hampered by many things, the last of which I haven't even mentioned yet, being time itself. Yes, over all this you are timed, and as an additional kicker, if you run out, the game will reset you to the very first level. Brutal. But actually, not really. You see, this is a very short game. While the original version included 6 levels, this port only includes 5, excluding the final, ultimate level. Once you really master the gameplay, you can likely complete this game in under 5 minutes. I kid you not. Should be added that dying doesn't restart the game however. In fact, if you fall or get destroyed, the game does quite a respectable job of respawning you approximately where you met your end. However, the more you die, the more time you waste. And the faster you finish a level, the more time you'll have for the next, which ultimately equals more points if you care about that sort of thing. Once you finish all five levels successfully, it simply loops onto the second level without even an end screen, but the score keeps counting. Be sure to write down and take a Kodak photo of your high score, however, since this cartridge has no way of saving it for future bragging. It is frustrating having to start from scratch on every game over, but if you could choose by level, even with cheat codes, you could probably individually complete all the levels in under half an hour. I can see why it is the way it is, but additional levels would have been appreciated, especially considering this was released 7 years after the original. Once you master every level and can play them from start to finish, there is absolutely no replay value whatsoever apart from a two player mode. I wish I could tell you more about that too, but I found very little information about it online and couldn't even find a PDF scan of the instruction manual to educate me more on the subject. I only know of its existence because it's mentioned on the title screen, however it seems a link cable is required and without that you can't even access the mode. Apart from that, there are two ways to use the controller, one designed to be played at a 45 degree angle and another at 90 degrees. This illustration in the manual of the NES version describes it best. 90 degrees is certainly the better way to go and feels a lot more natural since holding the entire Game Boy on an angle is a bit weird. Otherwise, while short, Marble Madness plays extremely well on the Game Boy. I did find a few issues with the collision detection, but these moments were so far apart that it's hard to bash the game for it. The amount of content is truly the major problem with this port, and if I were to nitpick, I guess it could be said that it is a little bit hard to see what's going on sometimes on such a small screen, but I played this mostly through the Super Game Boy on the SNES, so it wasn't really a problem for me. I found the graphics to be fantastic by the way, 
The UFO graphic nature is striking to say the least, and the developers have done quite a decent job of drawing the geometry and rendering the shadows. The default colour mode on the SGB does the job, but if a GameCube's Game Boy Player is all you have handy, the black and white mode does a great job of recreating the Game Boy's monochrome screen. Although I did like using the SNES controller more to play, since the GameCube has such a tiny directional pad. Otherwise, the sound effects can be grating, but I did quite like the music. There's not a lot of it considering the whole game could probably be played while stuck in a Macca's drive-thru during peak times, but at certain points it feels like it could be from an 80s sci-fi flick, and that's totally okay with me. But considering this is such a short and sweet game, there's not a whole lot more for me to show or share here. Because of that, I'm not even going to bother with an outro. Bye.